Good morning, Harbor Creek Community Church, Edinburgh Community Church, and Mill Creek Community Church. My name's Todd. I get the privilege to be one of the pastor elders of this network. We're committed together to love God, love others, and make disciples. Today, if you're a guest, we'd love for you to sign up on one of our websites, uh, millcreek.org slash guest, or edinburgh.org slash guest, or harborcreekcc.org slash guest. We'd love to give you a gift, pray for you, and connect with you in some way. Speaking of guests, we have a guest pastor today, Bill Cox. Many of you know him from the area. After 20 years of vocational full-time ministry, uh, he went out on his own, got trained under the John Maxwell Training Center, and he's trained leaders, hundreds of them in our area, and coached them for several years now. He's married to the love of his life, Maureen, and they have a great son named Joel. So would you sing with us this morning and worship the King wherever you are? I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would owe a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. But as I ran my hellbound race, Indifferent to the cost You looked upon my helpless state And led me to the cross And I beheld God's love displayed You suffered in my face You bore the wrath reserved for me Now all I know Hallelujah. 
Jesus is my life. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. Streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, There's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. church and so glad that you have joined in with us today and I wanted to take a moment and remind us of what happened last week. All over the area you saw pictures on Facebook, social media, Instagram, or wherever you went uh, that said dressed in blessed or Jesus changed my life and you saw those hashtags all over and so in the beginning of the service you saw some slides that had some pictures of families and they showed how they gathered in worship for Easter as we celebrated the risen Savior. And so we want to introduce a chance now for you to hear all of those testimonies in one place. So let's watch this together as we celebrate how Jesus changes our lives. Hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. Hey, everyone. Hi, my name's Chloe. Hi, guys. Hello, everyone. Hello, dear friends. Okay, here we go. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hey, guys. Hi, everybody. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hey. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello, everybody. Hi, folks.
I never really had Jesus in my life when I was young or even as a young adult. I, I never really followed a command to follow Jesus. I just knew about him. What I really was was a person who was selfish and living for themselves. I just didn't really ever understand who Jesus was. So I didn't know how to have a relationship with God and I didn't care. I viewed everyone and everything through a distorted, cloudy lens. I definitely went my own way. I spent time in the church when I was young, um, never really connected to it. I used to always just be stressed with getting tasks done on time and trying to accomplish things that I just have no control over. And I was as lost as lost can be. I was living a life um, I didn't want to. I lived for myself and I was selfish. I was trapped by fear for many years. I couldn't do it. I really felt worthless. And I was basically living a life of worshiping myself. I really got caught up in the things of the world. I would keep Jesus at arm's length for my convenience. A lot of hurt in my life and um, carried around a lot of guilt with me. I was totally selfish. I knew that I could not do life on my own anymore. I needed a savior. I was completely lost without Jesus Christ as my savior. Jesus came to rescue us by living a perfect life, by dying a death to cover our sins and to rise again. He died on the cross for all of our sins and he took our place. He changes you from the inside out. He took every sin and everything we've ever done and he, he took the pain and the suffering on that cross. And his love that he has shown me um, by dying on the cross and rising for my sins. He's forgiven me. So I felt like I had had dark glasses on my whole life and I didn't even know it and somebody just came by and took those glasses off and I could see light for the first time. He paid the penalty for all of those sins on the cross. He sent his one and only son Jesus Christ uh, living the perfect sinless life that I cannot live and dying the death that I deserve. Jesus still died on the cross for me. Jesus forgives all sins. He saved me from my sins. He took my place upon the cross. God had so much love for me that he put his son to death on the cross. Jesus grabbed hold of me and drew me in. He forgave me, he changed me. The gospel is this, that God shows his love for us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus changed my life. Jesus changed my life. Jesus changed my life. But Jesus has changed my life. 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 Jesus transformed me. Jesus changed my life. Jesus changed my life. Jesus Christ changed my life. Jesus changed my life. Jesus changed my life. Jesus has changed my life. Jesus changed my life. Jesus Christ has set me free. Christ changed my life. I said yes to Jesus. Jesus changed my life. Jesus has changed my life. Jesus changed my life. Jesus changed my life. Christ has changed my life. Jesus has changed my life. Christ changed everything around my life. I've learned to seek him first. He gave me a desire to have mercy and compassion on others. I have found healing. I have a hope and a promise. I was forgiven, like I was truly forgiven. He's taught me to place my focus on um, my children's hearts. I continue to grow in my, in my walk with him, my understanding of who he is. And wow, did my life ever change. He's given me the confidence that he will work all things out for good for those who love him according to his purpose. I'm accepted. Um, he gave me a new heart and my desires just slowly began to change. I was his. My life has never been the same. I have trust in Christ and he has set me free. Now I have this true joy and I understand what happiness is. I have peace, love, and joy. Christ became more important to me. I love Jesus more than anything. Good morning, church. Uh, Pastor Jim, it's a privilege to be able to stand here and read God's word to you as 
Uh, we prepare to hear from Bill and the message that God has on his heart. I encourage you to open your Bibles to Genesis, the 39th chapter. I'm going to read just the first six verses. Uh, this is the story of Joseph and the introduction of him as he is in Egypt. Verse 1, now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, the, an Egyptian, had brought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house, and he put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he had been made an overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. May God bless the reading of his word. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we're grateful for another day that we have to worship you, the living God. And Father, we uh, are praying for Bill as he brings this message. I, I pray that his thoughts, his words, are all empowered by the indwelling Holy Spirit. And I pray that the message that he brings, Father, brings encouragement to the body of Christ and conviction to our souls. Father, where we need to uh, be more obedient in our, our lives, I pray what we hear will cause us to be seekers of Christ and be more Christ-like. I pray these things in his name and for his sake. Amen. Hello, church. It is so good to be with you today. And no matter where you're joining us, whether it's around uh, in, in the living room with your family on the couch, or maybe you're out at the kitchen table, maybe you're actually driving right now, just make sure you keep your eyes on the road, or maybe you're trying to get some exercise and you're on the treadmill right now, wherever you're at, Thank you for joining us. I am so excited to be able to speak to you today. I'm actually speaking from the church that I attend. Uh, the friends at New Beginnings Church have made this space available for me able to bring this message to you and so grateful to God for them. They're doing something really cool during these unprecedented times. You know, there are many pastors who don't have the technology to record their messages while people are at home and church has been opening uh, their facilities up for pastors to come in and, and record messages. And I just think that's amazing. I love it when the big C church kind of comes together and unites in a powerful way that just shows the world something special and beautiful about who Jesus is and what he's about. And I've really enjoyed getting to know your pastor over the past few months, Pastor Todd. I, uh, I just, I love his heart for Jesus, his heart for people, and really appreciate his passion for making disciples. So it is a true honor to be able to bring this message to you today. Today we're kicking off a 13-week series, 13-week series that we're calling Freedom. And it's going to be a series based out of the New Testament. We're starting in the end of Genesis today and then moving into Exodus on then to Leviticus. And what I can't think of a better a sermon series to come out of Easter. The events that change history, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The events that secured our freedom. Can't think of a better series to come out of Easter than with this one. So when you think about this concept, what comes to your mind? Maybe, you know, maybe for some of you, it's just this hot whole idea of you think about these, these, these habits or addictions or behaviors that for years, they've just dogged you. And the idea, the thought, if, if you could just break loose from some of those, you know that, wow, it would just change the whole trajectory of your life. Maybe that's what you think of. Maybe some of you think about, wow, I just love to be out of debt. And, you know, the, the mortgage payments and the rent payment and the credit card payments and that school loan that you've been paying off, which seems like forever. Wow, if you could zero that out for you, that would like lift a burden that would just change your entire life. Maybe for some of you, it's as simple as, oh my gosh, I, I can't wait till I can get out of my house. 
Uh, these stay-at-home orders and the social distancing, like for you, freedom would be like being able to go to Applebee's, <laughs> sit around a table with friends and enjoy a plate of loaded nachos. You know, maybe for some of you, just being able to go play 18 holes of golf or go to the park and play catch. And my wife, uh, a couple weeks ago, a friend of hers sent her this, this meme. You guys probably appreciate this. It was a, it's a little Debbie meme. I don't know if you've seen this, but day one of the quarantine, it's little Debbie. And then day 15, it's, it's big Deborah. <laughs> How many of you can relate to that? It's kind of making me hungry right now. But, you know, for myself, I can't even wait to go get a haircut right now. I've got about two pounds of gel just kind of holding it together. And maybe for some of you, in all seriousness, it's just the freedom from worry. I mean, you're just watching all these events unfold in our world, and it's just, it's hard to take it in. You just kind of got addicted to the 24-hour, consumed with the 24-hour news cycle, these presidential updates, and you see how it's impacting lives, and you see friends and loved ones losing jobs, even closing down businesses. You look at your own life, and you ask yourself, how am I going to put food on the table? How am I going to pay for my bills? What about my kids? You wonder about the future of your children. I have a son who's a senior in high school. He's our only. And, you know, my wife and I are thinking, you know, like, we're not even going to get to, our, to watch our son walk across the stage and, and receive his diploma. These are big things. And for many of us, it just consumes us with anxiety and, and fears. We don't know what to think about when it comes to the future. And the reality is this, friends. We all deeply desire freedom. Freedom from sin, freedom for our own brokenness, freedom from so many forces that just weigh us down and burden us. You know the great news today is that Jesus wants that freedom for you and I as well. In fact, you know what's amazing? The very first sermon that Jesus preached, recorded in Luke chapter 4, he got up on a stage in a synagogue, much like I am today, and he read words that Isaiah had spoken hundreds of years before. From Isaiah 61, the very first sermon Jesus preached, here's what he said. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. <laughs> the Spirit has moved and inspired me for this message. For he has anointed me, he has set me apart for this one thing, to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. That's what Jesus came to this earth, earth to do. But the question is, what is freedom? When we're talking about this word freedom, what does it mean? Because we know many people in our culture who have, you know, bought into a definition of freedom that basically says, you know, it's, freedom is the ability to, to do what, what I want, when I want to do it, how I want to do it, and with whom I want to do it with. Maybe you bought into that definition uh, as well from time to time. I know I have. We also know that the outcome of that belief, of that philosophy, of that definition of freedom really doesn't lead to freedom at all. It leads to bondage. It leads to slavery. No, the idea that Jesus had about freedom is very different from that. And again, Jesus does not leave us wondering. He tells us what his definition of freedom is. In John chapter 8, Jesus records this. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, and here it is, if you abide in my word, that word abide, meno, if you remain, if you continue, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth. No. The word gnosko, it's a knowledge that comes from experience. It's just not head knowledge. It's the integration of truth into my life. It's the experience of God's word being lived out in my life. You will know the truth. What is truth? Truth in our understanding in the Bible is that which cannot be hidden. Undeniable reality. And what is reality? 
Reality is life as God has designed and ordained it to function. And when we align ourselves with that, life works. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and that truth and the experience of that will set you free. I've thought a lot about a definition for freedom as we're kicking off this series. And if I had to put a definition of it in my own words as I understand it, I would simply say it like this. Freedom is the sense of completeness, purpose, and joy that comes from daily surrendering for God's, to God's design for my life. The sense of completeness of purpose and an abiding sense of joy that comes from daily surrendering my life to God's design. That, that my friends, is freedom. And today, as we think about and kick off this concept, we want to ask this question, how do you experience that even when you feel like you're being crushed by life? How do you continue to be faithful to God even during deep seasons of trial and adversity? How do you not just survive during those seasons, but, but actually thrive in the face of adversity? You might say it like this, how can you crush it? Even in the face of potentially life-crushing experiences. And that's what we're going to discover today. We've read the scripture earlier, our text for today from Genesis chapter 39. And this is exactly what Joseph is going to show us. He's going to model this for us. And in this text in Genesis 39, we're going to find two very powerful principles that can shift your thinking about adversity when life is hard, that can totally change the way you face it. So who's Joseph? By way of context, who is this guy in the Old Testament? We know that Joseph is the son of Jacob. Who's Jacob? Well, Jacob is the grandson of Abraham. We know that Abraham is one of the dominant figures in the Old Testament. He was the guy who God came to and said, through you, the nation of Israel will come. Through you, I'm going to bless every nation on the earth. I'm going to get my message out to the world through you, Abraham, and through the nation that will come through you. And it's his grandson, Jacob, who has 12 sons. And those 12 sons comprise the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. Jacob is a dominant figure. He almost takes up half of the storyline of Genesis. And I'm going to tell you what, as you read through that storyline, if you think your family, if you think God can't use you because your family has issues, or there's, you know, dysfunction in your family. And by the way, every family has the crazies. It's just to what degree we have the crazies. But if you think God can't use you to become that, I really, I really encourage you to read through Genesis. You'll find great hope because I'm, so I'm serious. This is a messed up family that God works through in amazing ways. This would make for some of the best reality television ever, the storyline of Jacob in Genesis. The Tiger King has nothing on this guy. And here we come into Genesis 37 through 39, and we pick up on Joseph's story. Joseph is not just any old son. Joseph is Jacob's favorite by far. Jacob knows it, Joseph knows it, and all of Joseph's brothers know it. Nobody's trying to hide it. They hate him for it. And we pick up on the storyline of chapter 39, and we see the extent to which they hate Joseph. They hate him so much that they throw him in this large pit, this cistern, basically a huge water well. It's so big, Joseph can't get out. They're going to leave him to die. They're eating sandwiches watching this guy waste away without an ounce of remorse. And slave traders come while they're there, and they decide, you know, hey, let's just sell him into slavery. And that's where chapter 39 picks up, and we see a series of life-crushing events befall Joseph. First thing is his brothers completely betray him, sell him to foreign slave traders. He ends up being sold to this gentleman. He's a military officer. 
in the Egyptian army. He's probably higher up with the Egyptian brass. One of Pharaoh's guys, his name's Potiphar. Potiphar's wealthy. He owns a lot of land. He has a lot of resources. So Joseph goes to work for him as a slave, and God, everything Joseph touches, God turns, it just turns to gold. Potiphar sees it, so over time, Potiphar just lets him manage all of his stuff, and he becomes incredibly successful in everything he does. Not only is Joseph successful, he's also pretty good looking, and that's not lost on Potiphar's wife. And whether she has a, you know, a marriage that's struggling or too much time on her hands, not sure what, but she gets attracted to Joseph and she tries to seduce him. Joseph continually rebuffs those attempts and finally he knows that the only way he can deal with this is if he actually flees and gets out of there. Well, she didn't like being jilted by Joseph and she wasn't going to take it lying down. So she goes to her husband and tells a complete lie that Joseph tried to try to have his way with her. Potiphar is enraged, has him thrown into prison. And here Joseph, we find at the end of 39, he's in a prison, unjustly accused, through no fault of his own, left to rot and waste away in a place that he knows no one. These are incredible circumstances. And maybe you can relate to that. Have you ever experience the sense of powerlessness that comes from a complete lack of control. Like, maybe there are things that have happened to you or are happening to you that have been done to you through no fault of your own. You truly have been victimized. Things that are unjust, things that are hurting you. And how do you walk through those situations? You don't want to look at this text. It's amazing. You know what I, you know what I don't notice? <laughs> is that Joseph is devastated by these things. There's a total absence of any sense of discouragement. And I'm sure these were very challenging situations for him to navigate and work through. But you never read in the text where Joseph gets so overwhelmed, disillusioned, discouraged to the point where he's like, God, what are you doing? Why are you allowing this to happen to me? I've served you. I've honored you. I've been faithful to you. What is up, God? <coughs> you never see that happening. In fact, we see just the opposite. Joseph just doesn't survive these situations. He thrives through these seasons. And how is that possible? Well, it's possible because I believe that Joseph anchored his life in some very important truths about God that enabled him to face circumstances, circumstances that would crush many people, but to face them with a completely different mindset. And I want to talk to you with the time we have remaining today about two principles and two practices. What do you do? How do you crush it when you feel like you're being crushed? And our first principle is this, as we look at this text this morning. And that is that God is present even when we seem alone. Now, you're going to notice this phrase in Genesis 39, this phrase four times. And I know that this church is a church that's serious about its Bible study. You do that the word is central in your small group life. And you know, if you're going to be a good student of the Bible, you know one of the key fundamental Bible study principles is that you look for repeated phrases or repeated words. Because when that happens, it's like God is flashing a neon light saying, listen, pay attention to this. This is really important. I'm going to say this multiple times. And there's a phrase in Genesis 39 that happens four times. The phrase is, the Lord was with Joseph. Look at this. Verses 1 through 3, Joseph was taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. Now check it out. Verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph, and he became successful, and he was in the house of his master, and his master saw what again? The Lord. The master saw it. Even Potiphar saw what was going on here. The Lord saw, was with him. 
And the Lord caused all that he did to prosper. Now look at these three verses. And here's what's really amazing. Another principle you, you want to look at when you're, when you're studying the Bible is a principle we call parallelism. When you see the same ideas presented in another place in the passage in almost the same way. Let's go to verse 20 through 23. This is after Potiphar had Joseph thrown into prison. See how it reads. And Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, just like he was sold into slavery earlier. The place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison, 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him his steadfast love. A little bit later, keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's care. Same thing. All the prisoners who were in the prison, everything Joseph touches flourishes. And whatever was done there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison paid no heed to anything that was in Joseph's care. Why? There it is again. Because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. God is present even when we feel alone. Why is that so important to understand? Because when we're walking through valleys and situations and circumstances that feel crushing, we can feel completely isolated and alone in those seasons. God can feel like he is a thousand miles away. And when we get into places like that where we feel desperate, it can cause us to become very disillusioned. It can cause you to start to question God's fundamental love and goodness. There's an account in Mark chapter 4 that this is exactly what happened to the disciples. Mark 4, it's at the end of a busy day of ministry where Jesus says to the disciples, hey, let's get into the boat. We're going to go across the Sea of Galilee. It's toward evening. And look what happens. Beginning in verse 35, it says, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Hey, let's go across to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat. Jesus was going along, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great storm of wind arose. Here's the storms of life descending on the disciples. Tough circumstances, and the waves beat into the boat. So much so that the boat was already filling. Jesus was there. He was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. Now check this out. They woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you even care that we perish? I mean, Jesus is there. But they feel completely alone. This guy who has control over the wind and the waves is doing nothing. It's like he might as well not be there. There's nothing worse than when we feel abandoned in life. Especially when we're going through crushing experiences. Just last week, if you think about the events that led up to the resurrection, we go back to Good Friday and we walk through that storyline of what Jesus went through, through his death. It was excruciating. But from reading the gospel, what was the worst part of it for Jesus? It wasn't even the cross. It was the knowledge that Jesus was abandoned by the Father. It almost broke Jesus. He said, my God, my God. Why? Why have you forsaken me? That was the worst part of this experience for Jesus. And why? Why was Jesus truly abandoned? And he was. The Father turned his back on him. He was abandoned so that you and I never would have to be. Psalm 139. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to the heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there, your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. God, there is nowhere I can go 
But where you are not there, you are present even when I feel alone. And this verse reminds us and leads into the second principle, and that is that God is at work even when we can't see it. Notice this. Even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. God is at work. What's the deal with God's presence? The big deal with God's presence is with God's presence comes God's resources. It comes God's protection, his provision, his power. That's what accompanies God's presence. It's not like God is hanging out on the couch with his foot up on the ottoman, you know, watching your life like he's watching a scene from his favorite movie. No, that's not how God operates. God is involved. God is actively at work in your life, even though you may not be able to sense it. Going back to Genesis chapter 39, we see this. Again, down here in verse 3, his master saw that the Lord was with him. God's presence was not just evident to Joseph. It was evident to people around him. Potiphar, an unbeliever, saw the hand of God in his life. And then he says this, that the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hands. Potiphar knew that there was a bigger force involved in Joseph's life. God was ordaining events. God was at work in Joseph's life to bless, empower, and flourish everything he touched. Again, we go to the end of the chapter, verse 23, where it says, The Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. It would have been easy it would have been easy for Joseph. You think about these experiences that he went through. Betrayal from his own flesh and blood. Unjustly accused, mistreated, thrown in prison, left to die. These experiences could crush the average person. It would have been easy for Joseph to become discouraged. But these truths anchored Joseph's life. He knew that he was not alone. And listen, friend, this theme, this truth is not just in the Old Testament. It's not just in the storyline. It's not just in the book of the Psalms. It's not just in the Gospels. It's throughout the whole Scripture, even into the New Testament letters. One of my favorite verses, this is a Scripture that just continually anchors my life, is found in Hebrews chapter 13, where the author writes, For God has said, this promise is for you. I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. That will never happen. What does the word never mean? Not even once. It's not possible. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence. You see the confidence that comes from standing on the truth and on the promises of God. We can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. So it doesn't matter what is happening in my life. The world can shut down and stop. I am standing on the promise of God that because I have this confidence, I am not alone, that God is working my life, I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? When I have God involved in my life, the big issues are settled. My life is truly secure. Everything else pales in comparison. He was not alone in any of those situations. When I was in elementary, I had, uh, you probably went through this too. You know, at the end of the day, after school's out, you go out, you get on the bus, and in our particular school, we kind of had to wait till the high school students uh, were transported from the high school over to the elementary, and then they would get on the bus, and then we'd all go home from there. And one day, as we were there, uh, there was this kid on the bus. He was a bully, and he controlled the back of the bus. And to protect people's identity, we'll just call this guy Scott Farkas. Scott Farkas was one of those was one of those guys, he was in sixth grade, but 
He was probably old enough to be in ninth grade. He had facial hair. He did not look like a sixth grader. And Scott Farkas loved to control the back of the bus. He loved to pick on kids. He loved to use his power to bully kids. And one day, my brother, who's about two years older than me, he was seeing this going on. And you know, my brother is, uh, he's got like this super strong sense of justice. He's like, I'm not going to let him go back there and do that. I'm going to go do something about that. My brother was my hero. And he went back there. And oh man, it was, it was ugly. My brother suffered a pretty significant beat down. And after a couple minutes, he kind of slumped back over to his, his, his bus seat with a big knot on his forehead. And at that point, I'm thinking, wow, if my brother like gets totally dominated, it's over. And just about the time I was feeling completely hopeless, there was this voice behind me that said, why don't you pick on someone from, from, with, from your own size? And I turned around, and it was like one of my ultimate heroes. His name was Chuck Karen. He was a senior in high school, and he was an athlete, and he lettered, and he had his varsity coat on and his big gold letter off to the side. You could see all the gold bars on it. And Chuck was like, he was like bigger than life to me at that time because he was powerful and he was popular, but he was also kind and he was humble. And when Chuck saw what was going on, got onto the bus and said, why don't you pick on someone your own size? And I swear it was like the heavens were opening right then. I swear it was like the theme song from Rocky started. And I watched Chuck walk past me, and Scott Farkas suffered a beatdown of biblical proportions that day that set and reconciled everything on the spot. And when I think about that, I think about my God. I am never alone. My God is mighty. My God is a rock and a fortress. And he is actively involved in my life at all times to bring about, as Philippians says, his good plans for my life and, and for your life. And nothing can thwart that. But what about those times we can't see? You know, Joseph, we read this story, and Joseph could see God at work in his life. He could see God prospering his life in the midst of all that. And I'm sure that was as powerful for him. Joseph couldn't see it. Or excuse me, there are many of you, you're going through these seasons and these situations. You can't see God at work. What do you do about that? What do you do when you can't see the external evidence of God's involvement? Well, I think it's important in those times to understand in those seasons, that's often when God does his best work. I don't know how many of you are planning to um, put in a garden this spring. But if you're familiar at all with the concept of planting, you know that one of the most <laughs> critical parts of the process after you've tilled your garden and put the fertilizer on is you got to buy those seeds, right? Those ones you picked up at Home Depot. And you open up the soil. And you put those seeds in. And then what do you do? You cover up those seeds. And before you get carrots or tomatoes, cucumbers, beans, what has to happen? That seed has to go into that soil and die before life can come. And all this amazing stuff is happening below the surface of the soil that nobody can ever see. It is the very thing that leads to the vegetables that you enjoy from your garden. That is exactly what God is doing in your life. He is at work. Even though you or nobody can see it, I promise you, God is at work doing something very special. It reminds me of the lyrics from a bridge of a very popular worship song out now, the song entitled Waymaker. Maybe you sing it and you're really familiar with it, but lately I've found it to be very significant in my own life. And I love the words from the bridge where it says, you know, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working, God. You never stop. You never stop working. You're the way maker. Trust me, friend. He's making a way in your life. 
You may not see it, but God is making a way. You're a miracle worker. Promise keeper. Light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yes, it is. That is who you are. God is at work. Even though you can't see it. So what do we do with that? Well, let me close with two quick principles. You can put to work in your life starting today. And the first is this. Number one, control what you can control. You know, as you read this storyline in Genesis, one of the things that really stands out to you is that Joseph didn't worry about the things that were beyond his control. Joseph had no control over being sold into slavery. He had no control of being unjustly accused. He had no control when he was thrown into prison. He couldn't do a thing about those. There are so many situations happening in our world right now that are completely beyond your control and they're beyond my control. And God is saying, listen, I am the Lord over history. I am sovereign. There is nothing that is happening in both your life or in this world that takes me by surprise. And nothing will change my plan for your life and nothing will thwart my plan for this world. I will carry it out perfectly. Don't you worry about those things. You control what you can control. And God expects us to take control over those things. And what is it that you and I can control? We can control our attitude, how we approach these situations. And we can control our actions, our activity every day. You notice Joseph, he just focused on what he could do each and every day with the opportunities that were in front of him, with the gifts and the talents that he had. And he used his gifts and his talents, the skills that God has given him, with the opportunities that were in front of him. And he, he did what he could do with them. And it was because of that that God chose to bless him. God empowered and blessed Joseph's life because Joseph took responsibility for what he could control. And he controlled his attitude. Joseph understood that it is not what happens to you, but it is what happens in you that counts. One of my favorite quotes from the last century comes from a neurologist and psychiatrist by the name of Viktor Frankl. He writes this, Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. To choose one's own way. You know why that impresses me? Because of Viktor Frankl's story. You see, he was a Holocaust survivor. He spent three years in Nazi ghettos and in Nazi concentration camps. And Viktor Frankl watched three of his family members die unspeakable deaths in those concentration camps. Not the least of which, which was the death of his pregnant wife. I can't even get my head around that. That would crush almost anybody. No one would blame Viktor Frankl for being bitter and angry and resentful and unforgiving even. And yet, he took the exact opposite approach. It was out of those ashes, out of that pain, that Viktor Frankl developed this type of psychotherapy known as logotherapy. Logotherapy basically states that we were created as people for deep meaning and purpose. And that purpose and meaning especially flows from those situations in our life that were the most painful, that were the most tragic, that were the most difficult. Viktor Frankl took control of his attitude. He could not control his situation but he could control how he responded and how he would handle that situation. And he became a powerful, his life became a powerful instrument of healing and change for thousands of people. Control what you can control, first of all. And then secondly, focus on the prize. Let's go back to the disciples for a second. 
When the disciples were freaking out in the boat, and they went down and they shook Jesus awake, and they were incredulous. And they're like, Jesus, what in the world are you doing? There's a belief behind that response. What is that belief? Well, the belief is that Jesus, if you're in the boat, then it should be smooth sailing because you're the master of the sea and the waves and the elements. And of course, Jesus, if you're in the boat, everything should be fine. Life should be good. So many people have this belief. So many Christians have this belief. If I'm a Christian and I'm being faithful to God and I'm honoring him with my life, then my circumstances should be favorable. It should be like the bull stock market. Everything is up and to the right. Everything is going great. And if it's not, then what is God up to, right? Then I just want to scream at God and say, God, make the pain stop. But I've lost my focus on the ultimate prize, on what God is really doing. And there's really only one basic problem with that philosophy. And that is that it's completely unbiblical. (laughs) I mean, if you read through the storyline of the Bible, it completely contradicts that theology, the health and wealth, smooth sailing theology. The storyline of the Bible is one story after the next of God's people being crushed by situations in life. And through those crushing experiences, God doing a mighty work to shape and transform his people into something beautiful and powerful that the world could see. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 2. Focus on the prize. Chapter 2, or excuse me, chapter 5, Romans, beginning in verse 2. Paul says, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege. You know what that's like. If you put your faith in Jesus, you know what it's like to step into that relationship and experience this undeserved privilege of being forgiven and being called God's child and being adopted into his family, where we now stand and we are confidently and joyfully looking forward to sharing God's glory, the hope we have of being like Christ and being in his presence for eternity. But there's something more in verse 3. We can rejoice too. That's not all. There's something else. When we run into problems and trials, what? Yes, rejoice when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. Here's the prize. Here's what God is going after. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope does not lead to disappointment. This hope does not lead to disillusionment. This hope does not lead to discouragement. For we know how dearly our God loves us. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. You understand, the most beautiful thing that happens when we go through challenges in life, and I don't like them any more than you do, God does a miracle in our hearts. He begins to shape and transform our character and refine us as his people. And through that process, we grow, we mature, we fall more deeply in love with Jesus. We appreciate his grace and his power at work is in us. And we grow in deep fellowship with him through that process. You see, trouble doesn't build character so much as it reveals character. And I heard Chris Hodges talking about this in a recent sermon. He was talking about grilling steaks. And maybe a lot of you can relate to this. I know in the Cox household, we love our meat. And there's nothing more that we enjoy than a great steak on the grill. This past week, my son was actually grilling, and he was so proud of the steaks that he prepared. He brought them, and he said, Dad, Mom, look at the grill marks on this steak. I've never grilled a steak this beautiful. And it did look impressive. Then we went over to the table, and we cut them open, and my wife kind of likes her steaks medium well. And it looked great on the outside, but when we cut it open, it was like red, almost bleeding. It wasn't done. And he had to go back out and throw it on the grill for a while. You know, that is the perfect analogy for your life and my life. We think we're moving along, maturing great in our walk with Christ. And then troubles hit. 
We get crushed by a life circumstance. Something happens to us that comes out of left field and it feels devastating. And we realize that, you know what? I didn't react to that the right way. I got angry with my spouse over that. I had an attitude that was horrible. I said things that I should have never said. And we learn that there's some issues to our character that need refining. We need to go back on the grill for more maturing, for more growth. That, my friends, is the prize. That is the glory of suffering. While we don't enjoy the suffering, we keep our eyes focused on what it accomplishes in and through our character in making us more like Jesus Christ. And when we grow that way, we are stepping into true freedom because we are beginning to harmonize and align our life and our character with Jesus himself. And that's when true purpose, joy, wholeness, and completeness begins to set forth in our lives. God is present even when we feel alone. God is at work even when we can't see it. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this text and for putting it in the storyline of the scriptures, for what we learn from Joseph's life. And God, we pray that you would help us reset our focus and align our lives around your truth so that we can look at circumstances through a completely different perspective and with confidence know that you are at work. Help us to trust your promises, Father, that you do your best work in these seasons. Help us to keep our eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured his cross, despising the shame and through that, because of that, he is set down at the right hand, the throne of God. Help us to keep our eyes on you, Jesus. Through your spirit and by your power, guide us through these seasons to get to the other side, to be people who are deeper, different, transformed, people with greater love for you and greater compassion for others. We will give you thanks. For it is in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Will you join us as we conclude the service with this final song?
Ciao.